please stand. We are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all around. Let us praise Jesus now. We are standing. On holy ground, we are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all around. Let us praise. standing in his presence on holy ground. Good morning and welcome to Hope United Methodist Church. I have a few announcements. My first announcement, and I should have told the Sunday school people this and I totally forgot. Oh, sit down. You all sit down. You don't have to stand for this. <laughs> So I should have told the Sunday school people this, but I totally forgot. Next weekend is our church conference, which means at 9 a.m., if you're on the SPRC team, we have to meet with the DS, which means there's no Sunday school, unless you all want to get together and talk amongst yourselves about this exciting book that we're reading. Usually we have Sunday school at 9 a.m., and we could always use new people, but not next week. So don't show up. Uh, next week is church conference, so uh, for most people, everyone who's a member of the church is invited to church conference, and that starts right after the service, so that starts around 11, 11, 15, so if you want to come to that, stay for that. You only have to be there at 9 if you're on SPRC, no one else does, so no Sunday school, church conference, come ready for that. Then, the week after that, on Monday, Halloween, we are going to have our trunk or treat. We still need candy donations. I don't know. I think there was an official basket, but I think Tony Jackson might have it. Oh, it's in the back. Okay. So we've got a big basket in the back. Bring in candy. If you want to have a trunk, bring your trunk, decorate it. It could be lots of fun. Yeah, so trunk or treat. It's going to be 4.30 to 6.30, I believe, is the time that we picked. Unless anyone knows what time the city trick or treat is. I don't know. All right, any other announcements that I missed? Yes, we got one from Ken. And just a quick announcement. I'm going to ask the, the trustees, members, if they'd please meet in the social hall right after service today for a quick little uh, important meeting. We have a decision that has to be made uh, today. Okay, thank you. All right, so trustees, yes. All right, so Women of Hope are meeting tomorrow at 10 here at the church, right? Okay. Anyone else? We got rid of the mold. So if you were here last week, we had a noisy offering where we got our change and put it in a bowl, and that was to get rid of that mold, and you did it. So good job. So thanks for everyone who donated, and also thanks for all the hard work of the people who did the cleaning. And yes. And then did I see Pam? I think we talked about that, and we actually said, let's do this once a month. So... Good idea. I think we are going to do that, but we're going to talk some more about that. All right. If there's no other announcements, then our liturgist can come forward and start our worship this morning. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim God's name. Make known among the nations what God has done. 
Sing to the Lord, sing praise to God, tell of all God's wonderful acts. Glory, Glory to God, God's holy name. name. Let, Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord's strength, seek God's face always. Remember, Remember the wonders God has done, God's miracles and judgments. The Holy One is the Lord our God. God remembers the covenant forever. forever. The promise, promise God made for a thousand, thousand generations. generations. Please remain standing and join us in Love to Tell the Story, our song of praise found in the hymnal on page 156. We're just doing verses one through three. <clears throat> Our reading today is from, chap from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. Oh, and you may be seated. <laughs> Jesus is tested in the wilderness. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit to, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up, lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, 
it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Our children may come forward if you would like for our children's moment. We've got candy. So. That's your bribe. What did you guys learn in Sunday school today? You had Sunday school, right? What did you learn? Did you forget already? It's only been five minutes. King Saul, what did he do? I think I remember King Saul, isn't that, one of you was King Saul, right? The kids did a play for those who weren't here last week. They did a play on David and Goliath, so you were King Saul. What did King Saul do? What's his deal? Yeah. So you were David, right? So that'd be like, if, if your brother tried to kill you, he would never do that though, right? And if he did, you would be really sad still. That's cool. Well, I'm glad you learned that in Sunday school. We're not going to talk about Saul today though, because you already talked about him. You're probably, you, you know everything about Saul. You don't need to teach me. So we're going to learn today about another person named Joshua. Have you learned about Joshua in Sunday school? What did he do? You guys know everything. You don't need me. All right, well, let's remind, let's, you do need me. Oh, good. So there was a guy named Joshua, and his name meant the Lord saves. You know, Joshua is the same name as Jesus, just from a different language. So kind of similar. They had the, pretty much the same names. So that gives you a hint of how cool he was. Joshua was going to lead the people into the promised land, but... By this time, the people have been wandering around in the, in the desert for 40 years. So you can imagine they were sick of the sand and the walking and living in tents and being hot all the time. They didn't have air conditioning back then. And so finally, they got to their new home, but guess what? There was a big city in the way called Jericho. And the people in Jericho said, nope, you can't live here. Nope. Jericho was a city, but it wasn't just any city. It was a, a huge city. It had a big fortress, and it stopped everyone from getting in the land, and they had these big scary walls. There you go. That's, look, at all those, look at all those walls. So what are they going to do, you think? Run up there and just knock it down? No one knew what to do, but God knew. God told Joshua what to do, but Joshua must have looked really surprised because it was a really weird plan. What do you think their plan was? So, their plan was they had to march around the city, not just once, but seven times. And then God told everyone, make as much noise as you can. Be as loud as you possibly can. You guys are great at that? Well, great. Can you imagine... 39,999 other people making as much noise as possible. How loud do you think that would be? That sounds real loud. Well, after they made all that noise, guess what happened? The city of Jericho just crumpled to the ground and fell down, and they were able to go live in the promised land. So I thought we'd try something. Do you want to march around the church and make as much noise as possible and see what happens? No? No? I want to. Okay, fine. We will. You don't want to see what happens? You don't think you could knock it down? Okay. <laughs> the trustees are like, no. <laughs> we don't need that. Do you think it would work? Yeah, it probably wouldn't work. Why not? I don't think God wants us to knock the church down, maybe. I don't think the point of that story is that if we're really loud, we can knock down a whole city. I think the point of that story is that God takes care of us. You think? 
And sometimes we got to be allowed to do it. <laughs> well, what are some things in your life that God can help you take care of? When it seems impossible. Take care of your dogs. Yeah, sure. Yeah, God takes care of the animals. What, what was that? Your brother? You have a, is that you or a different brother? Okay. So you got to leave sometimes people in your life. You just got to leave them in God's hands. Yeah. Him? God's got to take care of him? Well, I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to pray that God takes care of anything in your life that seems really hard, and then go home and make some noise. No, just kidding. Don't, don't do it. But have some candy, and I'm going to pray for you, and then you can go sit down. And remember the story of Joshua. God, thank you for these children of God. Help them to remember that you are always there for them, and that even when things seem impossible, you come through for them. In your name, amen. All right. I know I need to get more candy. I need to refill that. We know that God always takes care of us in our time of need, and out of that gratitude for God's care is when we give our offering. And so let's have our time of offering today if the ushers will come forward. Please stand and receive the offering. <clears throat> give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. And God, we give you thanks for all that you give to us and for the fact that we are, you give us so much that we are able to give out of the abundance of everything you've given us. We are able to give back to you. Take these offerings and use them to build your kingdom here on earth and to show the whole world your love. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing if you can, if you are able. And we're going to sing... They'll know we are Christians by our love. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray 
that our unity may one day be a and we'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in their land. And they'll know we are Christians, loved by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. And we'll work. Christians by our love, by our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. All praise to the Father from whom things come, and all praise to Christ Jesus, His only Son, and all praise to the Spirit who makes us one, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, and they'll know we are Christians by our love. You may be seated. Our second reading for today comes from Joshua, chapter 24, verses 1 through 15. You don't preach from Joshua very often, so I've got to find it. <laughs> Joshua 24, 1 through 15. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders of Israel, its leaders, its judges, its officers. They presented themselves before God. Then Joshua said to the entire people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your ancestors lived on the other side of the Euphrates. They served other gods. Among them was Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor. I took Abraham, your ancestor, from the other side of the Euphrates. I led him around through the whole land of Canaan. I added to his descendants, and I gave him Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I gave Mount Seir to Esau to take over, but Jacob and his sons were drawn down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron. I plagued Egypt with the, what I did to them. After that, I brought you out. I brought your ancestors out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. The Egyptians chased your ancestors with chariots and horses to the Red Sea. Then they cried for help to the Lord. So he set darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea down on them, and it covered them. With your own eyes, you saw what I did to the Egyptians. You lived in the desert for a long time. Then I brought you to the land of the Amorites, who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They attacked you, but I gave them into your power, and you took over their land. I wiped them out before you. The Moab's king Balak, Zippor's son, set out to attack Israel, but he summoned Balaam, Beor's son, to curse you. But I wasn't willing to listen to Balaam, so he actually blessed you. I rescued you from his power. Then you crossed over the Jordan. You came to Jericho. And the citizens of Jericho attacked you. They were Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Girgashites, Hivites, and Jebusites. But I gave them into your power. I sent the hornet before you. It drove them out before you and did the same to the two of the kings of the Amorites. It wasn't your sword or bow that did this. I gave you land on which you hadn't toiled and cities which you haven't built. You settled in them and are enjoying produce from vineyards and vines you didn't plant. So now, reveal, revere the Lord. Serve him honestly and faithfully. Put aside the gods that your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if it seems wrong, in your opinion, to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Choose the gods whom your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you live. But my family and I will serve the Lord. 
The word of God for the people of God. Now may the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. All right. I have a question for you. You don't have to answer out loud, but if anyone wants to, go for it. Uh, is there any part of the Bible that you do not like? Anyone willing to admit? No? Oh, I see a hand in the back there. I'm curious, but I'll ask later. I don't just mean, and I, when I say this, I don't just mean parts that you find kind of boring or dull, like everyone has trouble with the thou, sh or the, with the so-and-so beget so-and-so, and those long lists are kind of boring sometimes. But I, that's not what I mean. I mean a part of the Bible that just really gives you a bad feeling in the pit of your stomach a part that makes you feel a little queasy, maybe even a part that makes you start to question whether or not all this Bible stuff is really for you. If anyone's ever, I see some nods, so it must be some people, maybe not just me. Growing up, I was a Bible nerd, as many of you know. I loved the Bible, I did Bible quizzing, so I was real cool, I'm very popular with my Bible nerd <laughs> skills. <laughs> And I still love the Bible to this day, otherwise I would not be up here preaching it. But I have to admit, there are parts of the Bible that still give me that queasy, uneasy feeling. And the book of Joshua has always been one of those books. The basic premise of the book of Joshua is that the people in Israel, they've been freed from slavery in Egypt. They're led by Moses through the wilderness, back to the promised land that their ancestors came from. But the problem is, when they get to the promised land, there are other people living there. And the central problem of the book of Joshua is, what are we going to do with all of these people? And it's clear from the stories, like the story of the walls of Jericho, that the, the main solution to this problem in the book of Joshua seems to be war, invasion, and genocide. And I've not found a way to be totally comfortable with the book of Joshua and with the way that it handles this situation. And I've tried. I've wrestled with this book my entire life. Uh, growing up, I was a very fundamental Baptist, and we were discouraged from asking questions about the Bible. And so I usually wrestled silently, but, but I remember sitting in my pews and listening to sermons about Joshua and thinking, is this really what God wants from us? Does God really call us to kill not just other soldiers, but in the book of Joshua, they are killing families and children and even animals as well. Are the people of our modern day who kill and make war in God's name, whether it's the Nazis of Germany of the 40s or the terrorists of the Middle East or even extremist Christians in our own country, are they right? Now, when I first became a pastor, I swore that I would preach in a way that would acknowledge those people in the pews, like me when I was younger, who are kind of struggling with parts of the Bible. I swore that I would remember my younger self sitting there and wondering apart about all those ugly parts of the Bible and wanting to ask questions but being too afraid to. And I swore I would not back down from preaching about the ugly parts of the Bible. And not just talking about them, but kind of looking them square in the face and naming them for what they are. So I'm naming it. I don't like the book of Joshua. I don't know if anyone agrees with me, so I'm sorry. 
I think it's got a lot of ugliness. And Christians will try to get around the ugliness. And we've developed a lot of really creative methods to do this. Some say, you know, well, the people of Canaan, they must have been just so evil that they deserved it. Others argue that the events in Joshua never really happened, and it was more of a a revenge story that Israel made up during the exile to kind of help them get through this difficult time. Some will compare the Old Testament and the New Testament as if the New Testament God is a totally new and different God than the Old Testament God. There's, there's all these number of ways that we try to get around the ugly parts of the Bible. We try to justify these stories. And, and some of these ways make sense to me, and others don't. But none of them fully erase that feeling at the pit of my stomach when I read stories about God commanding the wholesale slaughter of men, women, children, and everything they've ever owned, everything they've ever built, every story they've ever told, everything they've ever made with their hands. I just can't wrap my head around a God who commands this kind of thing. If you've never read the book of Joshua, here's a recap that might clear up why I feel this way. So the Israelites... They've been wandering in the desert for years and years after escaping Egypt, and they finally arrive in the promised land. Their leader, their beloved and powerful Moses, he passes away, and Moses' aide, Joshua, becomes their new leader. Now, under Joshua's leadership, the people of Israel, they cross over, they cross the River Jordan on dry land, similar to the parting of the Red Sea. And from there, they enter the promised land and begin to kill all of the people there and take their homes from them. Finally, when almost everyone who lived in Canaan is dead, the Israelites divide up the land amongst themselves. And then at the end, in our passage that we read today, they get together and they renew their covenant with God as if putting a rubber stamp on this God's seal of approval on this whole story, as if God has kind of sanctioned these killings and deserves this credit. And so as you can imagine, I've really wrestled with how to preach on this passage today. You might notice that I have no slides during this sermon, and that's because I wrestled with Joshua for way too long, and I was still wrestling with it late last night, and therefore did not have time to send Diana the slides. So you got to look at me today, I guess. Uh, I wrestled with this book of Joshua for days thinking, what kind of good news can come from a book like this? And I got to admit, I almost gave up and just dusted off an old sermon from a different book of the Bible and preached on that. But then I remembered the younger me in the pews. And I remembered wishing someone had given me permission to question the ugly parts of the Bible. Wishing someone would drag out those ugly parts of the Bible into the open and expose them to the light. And I was like, okay, I I have to preach on this, right? But what can I say about such a messy book? And then last night, late last night, too late, I'm very tired, I'm sorry. (laughs) I wish the Holy Spirit worked faster sometimes, but late last night, I had a thought. I thought to myself, what if the messiness is the point. What if the ugliness is the point? What if we're not meant to ignore that feeling in the pit of our stomach, that discomfort? What if we're supposed to question some parts of the Bible, whether or not they are right or wrong? What if God doesn't want us to ignore the ugly parts but at the same time doesn't want us to jump through hoops to try to justify them or explain them away. What if we're supposed to just sit with that feeling for a while and see where that feeling leads us? I think one of the most dangerous mistakes we make is when we read the Bible and we assume that there's a simple moral to every story that's in it. I think this comes from a century of Sunday school and the the more modern publications of children's Bibles that often tell these stories and simplify them to the point where they're accessible to children, but unfortunately sometimes watered down in a way they were never meant to be so that they can have a simple good or bad, right or wrong moral at the end of the story. But Joshua does not have easy morals. 
It doesn't have easy answers. It's really hard to teach it to kids, so we just talk about yelling and marching around because that's fun. But though Joshua does not have any simple morals, I think it does have something important to say. And this is what I've got. This is my, the results of my wrestling. If anyone has any other ideas, let me know. Uh, but here's my idea about Joshua. Joshua is a part of what scholars like to call the Deuteronomistic history. And this is where I wish I had slides because this is a long word. But it's Deuteronomistic history as in Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy. Now, if you've read the book of Deuteronomy, it's mostly a book of speeches by Moses, Joshua's predecessor. And Moses is instructing Israel on how to live in a covenant relationship with God and with others, with their fellow Israelites, with foreigners, with humans, with animals. And Deuteronomy shares these laws as if they are simple and straightforward. And it says, if you do these things, if you follow the laws, you are choosing life. And you will live for a long time in this land that you're about to enter, this promised land. On the other hand, if you fail to do these things, you are choosing death. And you will lose the land and you're going to end up in exile and slavery yet again. And that's the book of Deuteronomy. Well, after Deuteronomy, thousands of years after, the people of Israel find themselves in exile. They, again, they lose their land, they end up in slavery, they end up in the land of Babylon, and during this time of exile, some people started reading the book of Deuteronomy and saying to themselves, okay, what went wrong? Where did we begin to choose death instead of life? Where did we go wrong in our history that led us down this path that ended up in the exile? And that's the Deuteronomistic history. The books of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, those are all a part of the Deuteronomistic history. And that is the readers of the book of Deuteronomy went looking back through their history, through their records, trying to figure out where Israel went wrong, where they chose life, where they chose death rather than life. They're trying to understand the exile through these stories from their history. And so when we read Joshua and when we read uh, the other books in the Deuteronomistic history, we have to understand that even though there may be moments of triumph and there may be moments of heroism and there may be moments when God shows up and does great things, this history still has a downward pull because the ending is the exile and the people who were compiling this history already knew that the ending was the exile, so they told these old stories in a way that kind of has a downward slope. And that downward pull starts right away in the book of Joshua. This is the first book of the Deuteronomistic history, and already you see that we're slipping down the wrong path. First of all, this larger-than-life figure of Moses is dead. Moses, the guy who brought down the Ten Commandments and parted the Red Seas, he's gone. We're done with Moses. And now Israel only has Joshua. And who, who's Joshua? The kids t couldn't even remember who he was, and I don't blame them because he wasn't a prince of Egypt. He wasn't rescued from the Nile. He has no heroic backstory. He's just kind of there. He just kind of shows up and, oh, Joshua's in charge. I feel like if you were used to Moses, Joshua would kind of be a letdown. Joshua doesn't wave his staff around and, and bring the nations to their knees like Moses did. In fact, he's a lot more human. He comes across as almost just a regular guy. Now, there are miracles in the book of Joshua. We learned about one with the kids, about the walls of Jericho. But these miracles seem a lot more muted. They're a little disappointing compared to the ones that came before. So we learn the story of God parting the Red Sea, and this whole sea stands up, and they walk through on dry land. And Joshua, well, he, he does something similar, but he parts the Jordan River. And if you've been to the Jordan River, I don't know if anyone's been to the Jordan River. I have. It's not very big. It's almost like a creek in some spots. I don't even think you would need to part the Jordan River to get across it. You could probably just walk through. So 
I mean, it's still cool. I've never seen anyone part a river. I'd still be impressed. But if you had seen the parting of the Red Sea, this is kind of a step in the wrong direction, right? We love the story of Jericho. That's another one. Jericho, it's a cool story. It's great. You get to make lots of noise. But Jericho's one city, whereas Egypt, Moses took out Egypt, which was the biggest nation in the world at the time. And so you go from this huge nation to this one little city. It's this downward pull. And I think what that's trying to tell us is that things are not what they used to be. This golden age is over. We've stepped down from this realm of like miracles and wonders that we found in Exodus. And, and we're starting to move into something that looks a little bit more familiar to us in the modern world. Something that is more like our everyday average life. And when you are in the real world, so to speak, you start to have to wrestle with the ambiguity, the moral ambiguity of living in the real world, with the messiness of living in the real world. And it turns out that following God's law isn't as simple in the real world as it was when you were out in the wilderness. One story in Joshua really drives this home. At one point in Joshua chapter 5, Joshua meets an angel with a sword, and Joshua's afraid. And he says to the angel, are you for us, or are you for our enemies? And this angel gives kind of a strange answer. He says, neither, neither. And so suddenly, we're in this weird territory where God's will is not clear. Where our next steps aren't handed down to us from a mountain chiseled in stone like they were with Moses. Where there's no longer this great pillar of fire showing us exactly where to go. We kind of have to figure it out for ourselves. We have to figure it out knowing that God is neither fully for us or fully for our enemies, but God created everyone and loves everyone and When we get into fights, we kind of have to work it out on our own because usually God is not going to come down and put everyone in line for us. So Joshua is this book of moral ambiguity. At one point, people believe God wants them to wipe out their enemies entirely. But over and over again in the book of Joshua, that belief is challenged. The people find good among their enemies And they find bad amongst themselves. And these lines between us and them get kind of blurry. Even though it sounds like, when we read today's passage, it really sounds like, okay, they went through and they went through the promised land and they wiped out everybody and there were just no no Canaanites left. But if you actually read the book of Joshua, you know that's not what happens. We have the character of Rahab, for instance. She's a very morally ambiguous character. She is a prostitute who ends up rescuing Israelite spies, even though she's from Jericho. And because of that, she's allowed to live, even though supposedly God has said, kill everybody, even the women, even the children. Rahab is allowed to live. And she becomes a part of the community of Israel. And so you see these lines between them and us, between others getting blurry, and you see the morality of this story getting a little bit confusing. And I think to myself, I don't love the book of Joshua, but isn't this just how our lives are today? How many of you have seen even a river parted by God? Because I haven't. (laughs) A lot of us have seen miracles in our lives. I'm sure at least half of the people here have seen some form of miracle, but They're small miracles. They're not those great miracles that everyone can see. And for whatever reason, that's not usually how God works in our everyday lives. We have a lot of problems in our country, in our world, that there are just not simple answers to. Who do we support in a war where both sides seem to have problems? Or what do we do when none of the choices that are in front of us are good ones? We are kind of like the book of Joshua. We are living with 
leaders who aren't as impressive as Moses. We are living with miracles that are wonderful and they're so meaningful to our lives, but they're not these big, flashy, showy miracles that we see in the Bible, usually. We're living in a world where answers aren't always clear and where we are going to disagree on a lot of things. In fact, we're going to disagree on what the Bible says, even, and how we interpret it. And I think that's the reason why we have this story at the end of the book of Joshua. So at the end of the book of Joshua, supposedly the nation has been captured, everyone's settled into this new promised land, and the people get together at Shechem, and they renew or remember their covenant. So it starts off, they retell the story of Abraham and the story of Moses, and they tell the story of how they escaped from Egypt, and then... Joshua says to the people, choose who you are going to serve. Are you going to serve the gods of the world? Or are you going to serve our God? And he says, as for me and my family, a lot of people have this hanging in their home. As for me and my house, for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And I think that is no, not so much a rubber stamp on the book of Joshua and everything that has gone before because if you read the book of Joshua, the people make a lot of mistakes. I don't think God is approving of those mistakes. In fact, I think the opposite is happening. I think this is a time where the people get together and they remember their history and they are called to repentance. They are called to renew this covenant with God. I think... It's so important for us. We talked about repentance in our Bible study class today, and we, we came to the conclusion that repentance looks differently for everybody. For some people, it's this big dramatic moment where our whole lives change overnight. And for others of us, it's a gradual experience where God is working on us from day to day. But it's so important because how easy is it to trick ourselves into thinking that God is on our side and therefore, everything we do must be right. And everything they do, what, whoever they are, our enemies, that other church down the road that we don't like, non-Christians, whoever, they must be outside of God's favor. But the book of Joshua tells us that God is on neither side. God is on the side of the world. God is on the side of life, not on the side of these petty human arguments that we get into. Now, when we get into these petty human arguments, sometimes we do ugly things to fix them. In fact, sometimes we have to do ugly things to fix them. I don't know if there was a better solution to the problem of Nazi Germany than World War II. And if there was, we sure didn't figure it out. So we get into these messy and ugly situations when there's no better way to live because we live in this real world with complex problems. But that's why it's so important to remember where we came from, to remember our story and to repent and ask God to constantly bring us back to that right path. We're going off that path all the time, and that's why we need to tell each other that story. And what's that story? This idea that God is for creation. God is for the world. God is for us, but God is for others as well. God is for us, but sometimes we find followers of God in the places where we least expect it, like Rahab and like others in the book of Joshua. I'm not sure if this satisfies the book of Joshua for me or for any of you. I'm not sure. It's, it's never going to be my favorite book of the Bible, I don't think. But it helped me to get a different perspective on it. Realizing that Joshua is the first in a generation of people who have to kind of figure things out for themselves. They don't have the pillar of fire. They don't have Moses. All they have is their messy human lives and an inkling of what God wants them to do. And so they have to call each other to repentance. They have to remember their stories and go from there. And that's the same boat we're in. I don't have a mountain I can go up to and come down with the Ten Commandments and tell us exactly how to run this church, which would be great because I think that'd be a lot easier. Instead, we have to 
go to meetings and argue with each other. And we have to talk to each other and we have to listen to each other and we have to figure it out. And so this idea of repentance is really important. And I wanted to do something a little different today. You all have your hymnals. And we actually have a confession, a little repentance liturgy in our hymnals that we don't use very often in my experience in the Methodist church. Have you had any other pastors who did the confession with you? Anyone? Has anyone been to a church that did this every week? Yes? Yeah, some people do this every week. Let me find the passage. Yeah, and we do it occasionally, but I don't think we do it nearly enough. This idea of 12. No, I think it's in the back. Here it is. I found it. I should have looked this up beforehand, but I was too busy figuring out how, how I was going to preach on Joshua. It's on page way in the back. It's uh, 890 is the number. So it's way in the back. And again, if I would have gotten my slides done, I would have this on a slide. But go ahead and look that up in your hymnals. 890. So probably the next page. It's called Prayers of Confession, Assurance, and Pardon. And I thought we would read this together, kind of remind ourselves where we're coming from and ask God to to make sure that we are on the right path. Does everyone have it or does anyone need more time? All right, let's read this together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. I love this because I feel like it really points out how difficult this can be. It's not just by what we have done, but by what we have left undone. That's the one that gets me every time. How much have I left undone? We are always in need of repentance. It's not always going to be this dramatic conversion where we're living a horrible life of sin and going to prison and and murdering people and God calls us back to the right path. But it's those everyday choices that we make. And the most important part of this prayer of confession is that that prayer of confession is not the end. What you have after that in your hymnals is what's called the assurance of pardon. And that's this promise that God makes to us that no matter how many times we mess up, no matter how many times we are faced with a difficult choice and and we get it totally wrong and we fail the test and we fail, God calls us back and pardons us and reminds us of the covenant, of God's relationship with us that God is always making new and pardons us. And that assurance of pardon goes like this. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in our goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. To me, whatever messiness we might find in Joshua, the good news is that assurance of pardon, that God is always calling us to the right path. God is always giving us a new chance. And God is not on our side, God is not on our enemy's side, but God is for the world. Let us pray. God, you leave us in a difficult world. When you ascended into heaven, you left us with this mess that we have to figure out. But we are not alone because you gave us covenant. You gave us a relationship with you to which you are always calling us back to. You gave us a relationship with each other, with this church where we are always retelling our story, remembering our past, and figuring out our future together. God, give us wisdom, give us courage, and give us love to be able to 
walk in your prom toward your promised land in the way that you would like us to go. Help us to always confess our sins and repent and figure out where you are leading us so that we can have hope for the future. Amen. Okay, we are going to move on to our parting song. Oh, joys and concerns. Excuse me. Okay. We're, no, we're no, do, sorry. Joy, yeah, I I'm sorry. That. I we had a miscommunication here. Joys and concerns. All right. Joys and concerns. Does anyone have any joys and concerns for today? Do we have a microphone? Okay. Let's start on. Let's. I see one hand here. Is there anyone in that back row? We've only got one person. So let's start on this row today. I usually start on this side. Let's switch it up. I actually have an old joy, um, listening to what you were saying. Um, I grew up in a very conservative Presbyterian church, um, and I had a, a little bit rowdy Scottish grandmother, and uh, she allowed me to argue all those questions I had about the Bible with her over the years. Oh, yeah. And actually, that's a great memory I have of my grandmother, being able to say, this doesn't make any sense to me. and. Um, so that, that was kind of cool. That made me think of that when you I were talking. That. My mom was like that for me, so I love that. All right, anyone else? We got Ruth. Yes. yes. Some of you who are not on the prayer chain would not know that my son-in-law was in a bicycle accident mm -hmm. as he was practicing for an MS um, charity ride. He was going on a bicycle path and the lady opened her car door and he slammed into it. He went airborne up and over the door and into the street. Thankfully, a car didn't hit him. Thankful for helmets. And he was bruised and scraped every part of his body, but no broken bones. So he continued and yesterday and today, he's in that ride. Yesterday, with the help of pain pills, he rode 100 miles in seven hours. Wow. And he's continuing today. Thank God. Wow. That's impressive. Well, great. We'll keep praying for him. Yes. Chuck. Uh, I have both the joy and concern. I, I talked to a longtime church member, Corky Cornell. He was very excited. Sound great. He got his 49th year AA chip, whatever they call it, uh, spectacular. I recommend calling him. And also he uh, needs continued prayers for healing. He's got uh, some health concerns and some are doing uh, much better. So uh, keep up the prayers and uh, God bless. All right. All right, anyone in this, this section? Or anyone here I missed? Okay, this section. All right, how about this one over here? Is that it? Anyone else? Anywhere? From anywhere? I have, it's not a prayer request, but it's an announcement I forgot to make. I was supposed to announce that we need people, okay, after the service, you know how we have our little snack and our coffee. If you are new here, we have a snack and coffee after the service, and it's great. We need more people to volunteer for that because the people who are doing it have been doing it for a long time, need some, some help. So if you are willing to do that, please let, I don't know who you would let know. Let me know and I'll, okay, let uh, Lori Mack know and she will get you set up. I think we even have a little bit of money set aside if you need some help financially to provide that. So that's my announcement. All right, anyone else? And well, let's pray today. God, thank you so much that you guide us. Even when our lives aren't clear, 
even when our lives are messy and sometimes when our lives are, are ugly, you guide us and you keep us back on the right path even when we go astray. God, we thank you today for all of the blessings that you pour out in our lives from rowdy Scottish grandmothers to recovery from this bicycle accident for Ruth's son-in-law and for his riding 100 miles, for Corky Cornell and his 49th year AA chip that he's earned, for everyone in this church and the hard work that they put in to keep this church running and to make it a great experience for everyone who comes in our doors. God, in addition to giving you thanks, we ask you today, we want to pray for continued recovery of Ruth's son-in-law as he still needs help recovering from this bike accident and that he would not be in too much pain. And for Corky, who still needs prayers for healing, we want to pray for those in our bulletin, for Andrew, Jesse, James, Avery, Christopher, Carl, Carol, Tamara, Cheryl, Connor and Sadie, Gail, Greg, Sarah, Jean, Martin, Michael, Michael, Michelle, Peggy, Rosa, Stephen, Susan, and for everyone in the Ukraine. We want to pray for those at our nursing homes. We want to pray for uh, Anita, Kay, Lee, Maria, Murdy, Sean Richards, and the Brokaw family, and everyone else in our bulletin today. God, we thank you for all you've done for us. We thank you that you continue to lead us, and we ask you to bring us into the future that you want us to come to in your name. And we pray this in Jesus, as Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy, be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will be done, be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us give this us day our daily bread, and forgive, and forgive us our trespasses, our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. Oh, oh yes, sure. We got one more joy. Oh, yes. A joy for Mary and for new people all around is always a joy. All right. Let's sing our parting song. I'll turn it over to Ken. Yeah, what I'd like to do is, it, this is a song that the choir has done in the past. It's, it's a little tricky, but if you have the green books in front of you and you know anything about music, I'd, it would be helpful if you have that open because just seeing the words up there makes it very hard to get the tempo and syncopation correct, especially if you haven't sang it recently, which I'm sure you haven't because I haven't until Wednesday. <laughs> So this is 3021 in your green books. 3021 in the green book. It'll also be on the screen, but if you can follow the music, it'll help you with the song, is all I'm saying. Please stand if you're able, and we'll enjoy this final song together. <laughs> Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, as we wait upon the Lord, as we wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, as we wait upon the Lord, as we wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever, our hope, our strong deliverance. Like you. 
probably should have sang it one more once you, now you're familiar with it, but we decided that's enough for today. <laughs> it was a good lesson, everybody. Thank you. Good job. As you go forth this week, remember God's faithfulness in the past, stand on God's promises in the present, and trust in God's plan for the future. Go in peace. Amen.